So good morning, I'm Reverend Bonnie, the community spiritual leader here at the center, and it is so good to see you all, to be home, and it was wonderful to be away as well. It was perfect. So what better way was there to step into this month's topic, a world that works for everyone, and today's focus, our part in creating a world that works for everyone, than to spend the last week of July in a different country, doing the best I could to speak a different language, eating different food, enjoying the beauty of different plants and seeing the culture, the dancing, the music, the customs. It was a fabulous way to step into a broader idea of what a world that works for everyone could be and is. So for those of you who don't know, there were five of us from here at the center who went down to the Centers for Spiritual Living's Convención de las Américas in Chapala, Mexico. Absolutely beautiful, absolutely beautiful. So bienvenidos a todos, welcome to everyone. I am going to share with you some of the adventures because those of you who were here the last Sunday as I was leaving, you might want to hear the rest of the story. And I will be sharing with you some of the lessons and teachings that we learned at the conference. These are just tidbits. Remember that we were there four days and each workshop was an hour and a half. And I'm going to try and squeeze in some of the highlights into this morning. I'm also going to look at how what we learn helps to inform us as we create that world that works for everyone. And I'm going to tie in one of the questions from our Q&A Sunday that I think fits with this topic. The question is, how, we are all one is a difficult topic in such a divisive and split society. Anxiety, fear, and frustration also seem to rule, help. So we'll look at that as we continue to talk about creating this world. So first of all, the rest of the story. The last Sunday that I was here, Teresa picked me up, and as we're driving over here, she said, so did you get the email from the airlines and get your boarding pass? No. Oh, don't worry, when we get there, we'll get it on, you know, we'll get into the email. I get into the email, and the message that I have from the airlines is, your ticket did not process the payment for it, and the ticket was canceled. <laughs> yeah, so, okay, it's nine o'clock. I get on the phone to order another ticket, and I'm on hold, and I'm on hold, and I'm on hold. It was 10.10 when I finally talked to a real person. The service starts at 10.30. Kathy was helping on her phone, trying to figure out what's going on while I'm on the phone of the center. Eventually, I order a ticket. I'm reading right off of Teresa's ticket, the, the, the airline that I wanted, the flight that I wanted to go out on, and the flight that I wanted to come back in. OK, he said, but I can't get you out today with them. But I can get you out tomorrow morning. OK, well, I thought, I still want to go down and cross the border with them. If I have to spend the night in the airport in Juarez, so be it. And I thought, maybe once I got down there, since Kathy had noted there were five extra seats left on the plane, maybe I could get them to switch from Monday morning flight to that Sunday evening flight. So we get down there. We saw the booth that said, Viva Ariobus. So we went, marched up there and said, habla ingles? No. So Teresa my angel, <laughs> one of the two, starts explaining to this woman in Spanish the situation and the fact that we want to switch from Monday to Sunday night. She takes my printed out portion and said, ah, este es reverso, it was in reverse. My ticket was from Guadalajara to Juarez and back to Guadalajara. <laughs> At which point, I will admit, panic started to kind of settle in and I and my two angels Kathy and Teresa remained calm remained totally supportive and the woman said the only way to fix this is over the phone because that's the way you ordered the ticket well my phone did not work in Mexico fortunately Kathy's did so I'm on the phone and I'm on hold and so I'll make the long story short because we think we were there two hours early I was on hold continuously. It would hold so long and then disconnect. I'd get back on hold and it would disconnect. I continued this as they went through the line. Their luggage went on to get on the plane. And I asked the woman up the desk, can you fix this? I'm on hold. Can, can you get me out today? No, she couldn't do anything. Then something clicked. And I said, can I just buy a one-way ticket today from here to there, and I'll deal with this other ticket later? Yes, but you got to go back over to that desk. <laughs> We ran over, 
talked to the woman. She, I was able to buy the ticket, ran back over to the other desk. She got my luggage. And the three of us did a happy dance that I was afraid might get us put away because <laughs> we were so glad that I had my ticket. I was on the flight with them, and off we were going to go. So that was <laughs> it was amazing. So once we were up there, we were surrounded by some wonderful people who were waiting to get on the plane. And I got to interact with a woman who wanted to practice her English. And I said, but I want to practice my Spanish. So we agreed to have our conversation, her speaking English and me speaking Spanish. Wonderful woman from Guadalajara. And we talked to her. We made friends with her. And since Teresa and Kathy were the VIPs and got to get on early, she and I were in the last rung to get on. We had a wonderful conversation as everyone loaded the plane. We got off and exchanged Facebook information, and I now have a new friend in Guadalajara, which is just, to me, that was the prize of the day and made it worth everything. And so one of the things that um, I did when I got home was uh, Brenda and I were sitting there going through our Facebook feeds and looking at things, and I kept saying, did you see this? Did you see this cute little joke or this cute little thing? She says, how come you get all the cute little jokes and all I get is politics? So I started thinking, and I realized that the way Facebook works is what you respond to, whether you hit the like button, the sad face, the angry face, whatever, the wow face, what you respond to, the Facebook magic computer thinks you want more of. The things that you respond to and comment on, it thinks you want more of. So that's what it starts generating in your feed. And so I told her, you've got to stop responding to that if you don't want it to show up. And you've got to get some more of these cute little things to show up and respond to them and like them. And so as I thought about it, I realized that Facebook is a huge microcosm of the macrocosm of how this universe works. What we like, what we comment on, what we repeat or repost, you know, what we share with our friends, we get more of. It just keeps showing up and showing up in our feed. And so I started thinking about that in terms of how it is that we're creating a world that works for everyone. Part of what we do is we get to choose what we like, what we respond to, what we comment on, what we share, what we're repeating and putting back out there, because that, those are the things that are going to keep showing up. Those are the things that the universe says, oh, you want more of? Here you go. And it just keeps feeding it to you, just like Facebook does. So keep that realization in mind as I take us back to the conference. The first speaker was Reverend Kathy Ann Lewis. She's from Seattle. And uh, she told a story. I just This is a little aside, but she told a story that put a lot into perspective for me. Their balloon payment that was looming over their heads was in the millions. And so our little few thousand dollar balloon payment that was going to be due in 2020 just totally shrunk in my mind. In fact, it's already being handled thanks to our board. David and John, thank you for the work. Uh, it's being handled, and we now have things settled so that it's going to be paid off in five years. Thank you. Thank you, God. And it just works amazingly. So when she told her story, I thought, wow, you know, it is all perspective. And her balloon payments being handled also. They have a beautiful story that she was able to share. So she started us off by basically challenging us and saying that we are meant to be on the cutting edge. We as a teaching are meant to be on the cutting edge. That new thought was the cutting edge of thinking when it emerged in this country. And it took old ways of thinking old stories and found new ways of applying them, new ways of approaching, using them in our lives, and new ways of telling those stories. And so what she said, though, is that the fact that we once were on the cutting edge is not necessarily true anymore. That a lot of what we teach has moved into the mainstream. A lot of what we teach, if you think about positive thinking, if you think about affirmations, businesses use those positive thinking posters in their offices now. And affirmations have become the norm a lot within the culture that we're in. So she also said that much of what we teach has become common knowledge, but not necessarily common practice. And that it's important for us 
on the cutting edge to be the ones that are practicing this teaching, to bring that into the reality of our lives. When we talk about that question of oneness, we can believe it, but are we practicing it? That's on the cutting edge, is when we bring that into our practice. And she said that it's really important that we take the personal use of this teaching and move it out into the world, beyond the US borders, into the larger world, as a teaching and as a practice. That that's what's gonna keep us on the cutting edge, which is where we're meant to be. Now that was just the beginning of her talk. It went for another hour and a half. <laughs> so one of the other teachers was Reverend Mark Anthony Lord. And he talked about the importance of forgiveness. Some of his quotes were, I ask forgiveness to set me free. Forgiveness is the gift I give to the world. So if we talk about a world that works for everyone, forgiveness is one of those gifts that we can bring with our practice into the world. Forgiveness releases us from fear and creates more love. And he was also reminding us that part of what we do is we are creating through what we are attending to what it is that we see in our world. And he talked about how it's like we're creating a magnet. What we focus on, what we react to, what we comment on creates a magnet that draws more of the same into our lives. So just like that Facebook idea, that's, again, another way of seeing it is like a magnet. What are you creating that's a magnet to bring more of whatever that is into your life? And so then forgiveness is a tool that helps to stop the old stories. Forgiveness is a way that the old tapes that support those old stories can stop. And he had exercises for us to do. And he teaches a forgiveness class. I believe he teaches it online. And, uh, and Larry's right now in the middle of his forgiveness process. So again, that's part of being on the cutting edge is doing that forgiveness work within ourselves and taking that out into the world. Now, one of the things that he uh, brought in to the very end of his talk, and Cheryl, I'm glad you're here, because it is the Ho'oponopono mantra. I'm not sure exactly how to say it. Ho, say it, everybody say it. Ho -o -po there we go. So this is the mantra that a Hawaiian man that worked in a mental um, institution used. Instead of meeting with people one-on-one, -on -one, he put the pile of the files of all the people in the institution, and he would just repeat this mantra, seeing each of one of them as whole and perfect as he did this mantra. And things started to shift. P people started to get well and leave the institution. So the mantra was, I'm sorry, please forgive me, Thank you, I love you. And that's what he would say. So uh, Mark Anthony gave us a little addition to those sayings, to those phrases, that helped me to understand the power behind it. So he said, I'm sorry for creating you in my world as less than holy. In other words, I'm sorry for seeing you in less than your full potential. Whoever that is, however that might be. I'm sorry for creating you in my world as less than holy. Please forgive me for my part in keeping you and me stuck. Please forgive me for my part in keeping you and me stuck. Thank you for helping me or letting me see what is in my subconscious mind. Again, the idea that whatever shows up in our life is a mirror. And so he was saying, thank you for helping me or letting me see what's in my subconscious mind. And then finally, I love you because love is all that is true. Love is what I am. Love is what you are. Love is all there is. And so he took that mantra and put uh, body movements to it because as he was teaching, he said, you know, that helps us to ground into our body and into our subconscious these words, and this can transmute then what's going on in your subconscious. So he would do, I'm sorry, please forgive me, thank you, I love you. You want to try that with me? I'm sorry, please forgive me, thank you, I love you. I'm sorry, please forgive me, thank you, I love you. 
And you had to say you're sorry because you might have bopped somebody. <laughs> but that was his final way. You know, if you practice that, of course, he says every day you want to do this to bring about that forgiveness work on the subconscious level. Then Reverend Cynthia James piggybacked on that. She piggybacked on the idea that forgiveness is very important. And so is changing our story. So changing the story that we tell ourselves in order to be able to move forward. And she referred to it as our root story. The story that we tell ourselves about ourselves or about other people. It can be, you know, that story, I'm not good enough, or I don't deserve this. Whatever the story is that's not supporting you in your forward movement. And that story is something she said that when we tell ourselves over and over and over, it's an energy drain in our lives. It's usually a story that's rooted in our past. And because it's rooted in our past, it is not the truth of who we are today. It's not the truth of our potential today. So she, again, had meditations and techniques of letting go of this old story and how to create a new one. And one of those uh, activities that she had us do included pairing up with someone that we didn't know and being willing to tell that root story for the last time. We had to agree that we were not going to repeat that story again. So think about it. If you know what your root story is, imagine telling it to a friend or a practitioner or someone who you don't know who's willing to listen and agreeing inside yourself to never tell that story again. So once we did that, the person listening was not to ask questions, not to comment. The only thing they did once we were done was look us in the eye and say, I hear you, I see you, I love you. And then they even whispered it in our ear. I hear you, I see you, I love you. And then the entire group got to affirm together, I am powerful, I matter, and I belong. And those words, when you say them, are powerful. So I know you haven't done the part of telling your story for the last time, but you can imagine it. But if you want to say with me those three phrases, I think they themselves are powerful. So I'm powerful. I'm powerful. Did you mean it? <laughs> I'm powerful. I'm there we go. I matter. I matter. I belong. I belong. How does that feel? Yeah. So there's some phrases you can continue to say as you change your story. Let go of the old root story and affirm, I'm powerful, I matter, and I belong. So that's part of what we can do to help create this new world, is we're letting go of the old stories and we're coming up with new ones. And so if we look back then at the question that was asked that Q&A Sunday, anxiety, fear, and frustration also seem to rule. One of the things that we were reminded of is, sure, anxiety, fears, and frustrations appear. They are appearances in our lives. And a lot of the workshops that they did, somebody had to go to the middle, which I know is terrifying for some people to think of, but they went to the middle. They did their work with all of us watching, supporting them in that process. And we were able to see transformation take place right there because the only thing that really rules is love. And that's what we were reminded of over and over again. That the other things, the anxieties, the fears, the frustrations, they had different ways of us releasing them, not even telling those stories anymore, and remembering that love is the thing that rules, the only thing that really rules. So I keep repeating, but I think it's because it's worth repeating. As we do our part in creating a world that works for everyone, we stop telling our old stories. Not only do we stop telling our old stories about ourselves, we stop telling them about other people, other cultures, other races, and other groups of people. We stop telling those stories. We stop liking, focusing, commenting, whatever, and we start new stories. In Shortcut to a Miracle, the authors say, our highest vision for ourselves is only a limited idea when compared to the greatness of our spiritual potential. And that's not just true for 
us, it's true for everyone in the world. So think about that. The highest vision that we might have for ourselves or someone else is just a limited idea if you compare it to the vast potential that's out there in spirit. And so as we remember that, and we change our stories about others and other cultures, we get to experience the world differently. So one of our other speakers was Reverend David Bruner. And he started off sharing about his relationship with his partner, who is Latino. And one of the things that he's um, chosen to do in this relationship is learn to speak Spanish so he can speak to his in-laws. And so he shared a number of funny stories about how communication, you know, different cultures when you're going from one to the other, some of those communication breakdowns, some of those different ways that they respond and react to the world and how they're learning from each other. But one of the things that I took away from what he shared that I think is most important is he said, when you learn a different language, it's not a one-for-one -one translation. Now, I move most of my language into sign language, and that's true there, too. We're not just putting signs to English words. We're not putting Spanish words to English sentence order. It's a whole different way of using the language. There's different idioms, different phrases that are used. And so he said he noticed that speaking a different language changed his thinking. And what do we say happens when we change our thinking? We change our lives. So here's another method, another way as we're creating that world that works for everyone is we learn a different language. We learn to think differently in that language. Something happened here. <laughs> hello, hello. I can skip. Are we on? Yeah? OK. So it's important, I think, for us to consider expanding through learning a different language. One of the things that David talked about was how in the US, especially the Anglo community, is all about go, 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 go. Let's get from this place to that place. Let's do this. Let's do that. Move, 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 move. And his partner, being Latino, was more like, let's just spend some time drinking a cup of coffee. Let's enjoy the scenery. Let's take some time together. And he said eventually he was able to slow down and move at a pace where he could enjoy his surroundings. And so he was thanking the community that sponsored the convention because they set the convention up so that we had time in the morning. Those of us who are early risers, we had all the way till 8.30 before breakfast was served. So we had time to sit there. I watched the palm trees, watched the sky change colors. It was beautiful. We had time over meals to talk to each other and, and spend time getting to know each other. We had time for self-care in the afternoon or time to explore the surroundings. And so he was thanking them for incorporating into the convention that feeling and that culture of having time as opposed to going to workshops from 7.30 in the morning till 10 at night and no stop for a breath. And so I was posting pictures on Facebook again of the environment that I was enjoying, the flowers and the water. And so <laughs> Larry knows it's coming. Larry posted, well, are you guys even going to the conference at all? <laughs> wink, wink. <laughs> and I thought it was a perfect example. You know, he was teasing with me, but also it didn't look like we were doing anything other than just lounging because it, we had so much time. And yet it was balanced with the workshops, the inspirational stuff, and with the paneling of new practitioners. We have, I don't know how many they paneled, but we have um, at least six, if not more. Six? No, more like uh, close to 20. 20, yay. 20 practitioners that speak Spanish to take this teaching into the Latin American countries. We had people from Argentina, from Peru, all over Mexico. It was fabulous. Somebody came from Canada, a gentleman from China. So it was amazing to have that going on as well as the time to be immersed in a different culture. So again, if we think differently, if we learn a different language, it helps to change our thinking, which helps to change our life. And as we're able to open to a different culture and a different language, we can open and the idea of the world or the one becomes broader, it's bigger. And so as Kathy Ann Lewis said, this idea is moving into the mainstream. 
but it's not necessarily practiced yet. So I don't know how many of you have seen the new Heineken ad. And I'm not a beer drinker, but I read about it on Facebook. So I went and looked it up. It's worth seeing. You just Google Heineken ad, and it'll come up. And they've taken, they did a study. And their main premise of the ad is to show people from different beliefs. So people who believe in climate change, people who don't. Someone who's a feminist and someone who isn't. And they take people from these different ways of thinking. They have them do a project together, and they have them talk and connect. It's, a, it's beautifully done. Of course, the uh, moral of the story is you should sit down and have a beer and talk. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not necessarily proposing that. I think we can have a cup of coffee, a cup of tea. The point was to talk, to do projects together, and to get to know each other. And what's interesting is that there has been positive response to that ad, but there's also been very negative response to that ad. So again, the idea has moved into the mainstream, but not necessarily the practice. And we are on the cutting edge. We can start having those conversations. We can seek out those people to sit down and have coffee, tea, whatever, and connect, do projects together, and start to bring that idea of oneness into practice. So as we are creating this world that works for everyone, we're doing our own forgiveness work. We're letting go of old stories about ourselves and others. And we're learning new languages, different languages so we can think differently. Several weeks ago when I spoke, or maybe a couple months now, I talked about love languages. So even within a culture that speaks the same language, there's different ways that we share and understand and express love. And the, the premise of that was that learning the other people's ways of doing this is like learning a different language. Well, on this trip, because I had so much leisure time, I was able to read a book. And the book that, I'm, that I have been reading is called Quiet, The Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking. Now, I kept thinking it was the power of introverts in a world that can't shut up, but it's <laughs> nicer than that. It's the world that can't stop talking. And it's fascinating because to me, um, I guess I'm perceived and I always perceive myself as an extrovert. And I'm beginning to shift a little in that. She's done research. She's done all kinds of research and she's connected with people who do research. Um, about different ways of approaching the world. So the bottom line definition is that an introvert recharges by having time alone. The extrovert recharges by having time with people. And then there's categories within there. You can have shy introverts and you can have not shy introverts and, and shy extroverts and not shy extroverts. But as I read this, I realized again that's another language, another way of speaking, another way of being in the world, or not speaking, of being able to be in silence. And she points out in there that again, in our US culture, we hold the extroverts up as this is the way it should be. They're the ones that get more jobs. They're the ones that uh, now most of our teaching is focused on. We do a lot of group work, and everybody has to learn how to be a team player. And yet she, po excuse me, she points out that most of the inventors that we know who have invented the things that we use today were introverts who did their best work alone when they had peace and quiet, and they could allow those thoughts to come through and those new ideas to come through. And she said, in other cultures, China, for example, the children who like to read, who like to take time to themselves, those are the kids that make their parents proud. Their parents aren't worried that they're not out there socializing. You know, what's wrong with them? We've got to get our kid out here and do a play date or something. So she was showing, again, the difference in cultures. And as we expand our understanding of different cultures, of different ways of thinking and of different ways of talking and the languages that we use, the more we expand our understanding of that world that we're creating to work for everyone. It actually has caused me to rethink how I'm going to do some of our classes, because the classes are definitely set up for people comfortable in groups. So I'm working on that. It's got my wheels turning. Overall, what I came to really understand 
from this week is that in order to do my part in creating this world that works for everyone, I have to stop being so ethnocentric, looking at my world as the way it should be. My world's the right world. And instead, allow that to expand and see how God expresses in so many different ways through so many different people. And in a multitude of languages, whether it's love languages, whether it's the language of the introvert or the extrovert, or languages of people in different countries. The key, I believe, is for us to keep moving to our edge, putting ourselves out there to meet people and be around people who are different than us, and bring our teaching to that edge and practice through our understanding of our oneness and our wholeness with everyone. The circumstances that started our vacation, our trip, were challenging for me, and I think it was challenging for the two angels that were traveling with me, because there was a part of me that kept going, oh, just call the taxi driver that brought us over here. I'll slink back across the border. I'll go home and hide for a week. You know, I was just like, oh my god, the idea of being Overnight there, once I got there, there was no air conditioning in that airport. I just, I was like, ah, you know, I didn't want them to leave me there alone. And so I tried to stay calm. The two of them remained so calm. It was perfect. And again, the song this morning about sometimes you need a friend. Thank God I had my friends yes. with me. Because I don't know that I would have gotten down there without them and stayed that calm. And then Teresa told me and told them, I am making it my personal mission to make sure Reverend Bonnie returns to the United States. <laughs> so she was checking with me, and we made sure that I had my boarding pass. We made sure that I had my email. Everything was in line. And it was smooth sailing when we came back. So these two are amazing. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. It was, for me, a whole different experience to sort of feel like, whoa, I'm just riding along here and letting spirit do its thing, and we, we did it. The mantra that I kept telling myself when I would go into fear was, spirit in the midst of us is mighty. I got that from Wellspring. That's their closing benediction, part of it. And I just kept saying that, and I kept saying, spirit in the midst of all these differences is mighty. Spirit in the midst of us is mighty. And I would picture myself on that plane, sitting with them and getting there with them and not going in the morning after. And that's what my experience ended up being. Ultimately, what came across my feed was people were so friendly. People were helpful. People were sharing. Even the guy sitting next to me on the plane wanted to share his cookies with me. You know, people were just friendly and willing to share and to help. I was surrounded by all kinds of people that helped us figure out what we were doing and where we were going. And the trip concluded with a cab driver who serenaded us in the most amazing voice all the way from where we were staying to the airport. Oh, it was, it was amazing. And it was one of those things where I was like, OK, hopefully he's focusing on the road. Focus on him. Focus on what I like, not on the fact that I'm terrified that we might, you know. And I just kept focusing on his beautiful voice. And it was fabulous. It was a fabulous way to end our trip. So our part, again, in creating a world that works for everyone, it's as simple and as challenging as doing our forgiveness work, letting go of our old stories, our old stories about ourselves and our old stories about others and other cultures and other people, keeping our focus, pressing the like button and our comments and our reactions on the feed that we want to see showing up in our life and not on the stuff that we don't want to see. Just let that stuff scroll on by. And in other words, what we always say, to change our thinking in order to change our lives. And so it is. Thank you.